I am Dr. Renu Thakur, Associate Professor, Department of Ancient Indian History, Culture and Archaeology, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Bagh Cave Paintings The Bagh Caves are one of the great centers of Buddhist fresco paintings after the Ajanta Cave Paintings in India. The credit of discovery of the site goes to Captain Dingerfield, who in the year 1818 observed the area around the Bagh Caves. He was the first one to write on Bagh Caves and give a first-hand description about the caves, which even then were in a very dilapidated state. After the captain's painstaking effort, Dr. Impey was the second scholar who wrote a paper on Bagh paintings published in the Journal of Asiatic Society in 1857. The Bagh Caves in the Gavalier State, a book edited by John Marshall and his colleague J.P.H. Vogel in 1927 gave an excellent theoretical explanation about the caves with some visual treats. A special issue published by Marg in the year 1972 under the title Rhythm of Dance and Music in Bagh gives a fabulous description of the art as well as the architecture of the caves. More recent works on the paintings in the caves include Anupa Pandey's The Buddhist Cave Paintings of Bagh published in the year 2002, followed by a book written by Meena Talim, Identification and Interpretation of Bagh Paintings. One of the most recent monographs on Bagh and Ajanta paintings is by Walter Spink in 2017. It gives a comparative picture of both the caves. Now we will discuss geographical and topographical location. The Bagh Caves are a group of nine rock-cut monumental caves among the southern slopes of the Vindhyas in the Bagh town of Dhar district in the state of Madhya Pradesh, situated in central India. The emergence of the name Bagh was due to the river Bhagini flowing nearby the caves, located approximately 240 kilometers to the northwest of Ajanta. Scholars claim that Bagh was contemporaneous to Ajanta cave paintings as the artistic style of both are somehow similar to each other. What is interesting is that all the nine caves are vihars and there is no Chaitya hall here. Though the main caves that have a quadrangular plan do have a sanctum in the back wall that houses a stoop forming a small chapel. The caves are in a very dilapidated condition which is quite evident from the fading of the paintings. The frontages of the caves extend over about 750 yards. The landscape around the caves is surrounded by good forest cover, which is evidenced also from the surviving paintings where the natural flora, variety of flowers, fruits, creepers and foliage is depicted in the borders at the corners of the images. The caves look especially beautiful during the rainy season when river has water and forest is lush green. During the ascent to cave, one meets many springs but the heavy rainfall in this district creates problems as well as it has helped to speed up the natural processes of the deterioration of the caves and it hinders access to them. The remnants of the paintings were very few even in the early 20th century. The primary reason for the deterioration of the painting is accredited to natural factors. In an otherwise basaltic region, the cliff site where the cave have been excavated is of sandstone and resting about this layer is a band of clay stone. The weight of the clay stone and the moisture percolating from it have been the factors chiefly responsible for most of the damage to the caves. In fact, after the roof of the veranda in some of the caves collapsed, exposing the cave to direct weathering, the tempo of deterioration has been so fast that even copies prepared by A.K. Haldar and Nandlal Bose have to be mentally reconstructed today 
and from surviving fragments of line and color. Now we will discuss the historical background of these caves. The rich heritage of Indian art during the ancient period includes monumental and sculptural art, along with which fresco paintings too are significant art form, especially during the reign of the Guptas. The paintings at Bagh, not as popular as the Ajanta frescoes, have in comparison been somewhat overlooked and ignored in the field of paintings, though over time scholars have increasingly focused on them. The caves were the work of Mahayan Buddhists. The painting at Bagh seen as if they were all executed at the same time or were conceived as a single scheme. According to the Dashkumar Charit, the ten princes composed by Dandin in the 7th century, the Vakata king Harisen had a son who ruled over the Bagh region. A copper plate inscription has been found at the cave which is about Maharaja Sabandhu who ruled in later times when the Vakatak line had collapsed. Therefore, the caves can be dated somewhere between 470 to 480 AD. When the king Sabandhu provided money for repairing the broken bark caves, some historians also propose a time period of 5th 6th century for these caves. Now we will discuss the paintings. The significance of Bhag paintings can be assessed from a statement by Marshall in his work. The school which these paintings represent was the source and fountainhead from which the art of Asia drew its inspiration and no one can study their rhythmic composition, their instinctive beauty of line, the majestic grace of their figures and the boundless wealth of their decorative imagery without realizing what a far-reaching influence they exerted on the art, not of India alone and her colonies, but of every other country to which the religion of Buddha penetrated. In comparison to Ajanta, the paintings at Bagh are fewer, yet the quality of these paintings makes for a captivating visual experience. The subject matter of the painting is Buddhist, the Jataks along with the depiction of Buddha and the Bodhisattva, though there are also the depiction of secular figures such as Persian lady or a female musician. Total paintings are found in caves 2, 3, 4, 5 and 7. Although in most of the caves there are only fragments of the original decoration with the most work visible in cave number 3 and cave number 4. In fact, Cave number 4 is the largest in the series, both in terms of structure and ornamentation and the extent. Evidence suggests that it was once profusely decorated with paintings. The main scenes are located in the veranda of Cave 4 and Cave 5. In fact, the best preserved portions of the park paintings is found on the inner wall of the veranda of Cave 4. The paintings have been identified differently by various scholars and have for long remained a puzzle. The main scenes in the veranda represent the following. Now we will discuss scenes. Scene 1. Two women are seated in an open pavilion with one of them weeping while the other seemingly consoles her. The scene 2 discusses in a grove four men seated and appear to be in a serious discussion with one who looks like an ascetic sermonizing. Scene third discusses a group of male figures in the upper section of the work and below a group of female musicians with just their heads visible. The fourth scene discusses two groups of female musicians playing musical instruments as a male figure is shown in the center of each group. The scene five, a cavalcade of horses with riders who seem to be nobility. In scene 6, a procession of elephants led by a young man of noble birth. The scene 7 discusses, in a grove, two men shown seated with one preaching to the other. In this regard, J.P.H. Vogel states that it is a Jatak or an Avadan, whereas 
John Marshall identifies it as a representation of Mahajanak Jatak. And Anupa Pandey is of the opinion that it is the representation of the story of nuns' conversion. Other scholars have identified the painting with two groups of female musicians with a male in the center as Hali Salasya, a folk dance with the dancers in a ring consisting of a double group of female musicians led by a man. There are other identifications of the paintings that shall be explored as some of the main paintings are discussed in greater detail. The detailed description and analytical discussion of some of the paintings Paintings in cave number 4 is as follows. Scene number 1. In this two women seated in an open pavilion can be distinguished easily. The one who is on the right side of the painting seems to be grieving. As with her right hand she has covered her face and the left hand is extended out in an eloquent gesture of grief. The woman on the left is seated in an elegant posture and seems to be consoling the grief-stricken women, possibly listening to the painful story of the women. The woman who seems to be lamenting is simply attired in a white wearing, just a hand ornament, whereas the other woman is bejeweled, adorned with a beaded small and a long neck piece, head ornaments and a girdle around her waist. Her hair are tied in a knot and possibly adorned with flowers. This seems to indicate that the woman belongs to the elite class, maybe a princess. She has placed her left hand on the right shoulder of the weeping woman, a gesture of consolation. The postures of both women are very expressive, one of her deep grief and the other is of agony. She feels an other expressive of concern and empathy. Anuba Pandey underlines the success of the artist in conveying the grief of the woman who is weeping simply through the hands that communicate the emotion even when the face is not visible. There are traces of a pair of birds, those are pigeons, fluttering their wings on the roof of the pavilion where the women are seated, adding not just greater naturalism but also poignancy to the scene. The artist has employed contrast of colors, white against browns, to impart freshness to the palette. His success also lies in conveying the emotions and the moods of the situation with such ease and success. Here the link of park paintings with paintings at Ajanta is visible, particularly in the use of highlight on the lower lip and the bridge of the nose, to give form a certain roundedness. There is difference in the perception of various scholars regarding the interpretation of this painting. According to Meera Talim, this painting is based on Malini Vastu of Mahavastu Avadanam, which is a full episode of the bravery of Malini, the daughter of the king of Banaras, who was devoted to Buddhist monks and her devotion angered the community of Brahmins and they all persuaded the king to give Malini a death sentence. But with her intelligence and courage, she managed to escape this. As soon as the news of her death sentence came to her chamber, all the ladies inside were grief-stricken and started weeping. According to Talim, it is this episode that is represented in the painting. She identifies the woman who is well ornamented as the princess, Malini and the second lady who is overwhelmed with grief and is covering her face with an upper garment as a woman from the lady's chamber. It seems that the weeping lady has come from outside and has disclosed the news to the princess. The other interpretation is by Krishna Chaitanya who relates this scene to Gautam Buddha leaving his home in search of enlightenment. In his opinion, this scene depicts Gautami, the foster mother of Siddhartha, trying to console Yashodhara. After all efforts, to bring him back fail. This description is found in the Buddha Charita, whereas Anupa Pandey identifies the scene as that of the weeping Sundari, who is grief-stricken after receiving the news that Nanda has joined the monastic order. Now we will discuss scene number two. This particular painting is to the immediate right of the above discussed painting.
This scene depicts four male figures with a dark copper colored complexion. All four are seemingly involved in some serious discussion. The two persons on the left appear to be hermits or ascetics with their shaven heads and one of them has an uplifted hand which seem to indicate that he is professing something to the other. Two persons sitting across him. All four men are depicted seated on round blue and white cushions and wear stripped dhotis with white and light brown or cream colored stripes on it. The two persons seated on the right seem a bit different from the ones on the left. They seem to be from the elite section of society, especially the figure second from the left hand side who wears an elaborate headdress studded with beads and jewels, earrings and armlets with the one on the extreme left also wearing a crown and armlets. Three of them wear double necklaces. The one who seems to be preaching is adorned with a single strand beaded neck piece. There is a small child or dwarf like figure on the left side of the painting accompanying the persons on the left. He is blue in color distinguished by a curious white crest trefoil shaped on the top of its head. The scene is laid in a garden park or a forest as is indicative from the foliage present in the background in the painting. Here the artist places dark figures against a dark green foliage background and yet the figures are clearly discernible. The entire atmosphere of an intense and serious discussion is here conveyed through the expressions and the hand gestures. Anupa Pandey identifies this as the sermon in the grove. When Buddha gives a sermon to Nand, explaining to him that if affection, desire and passion did not exist, then happiness would be his. According to another identification, this painting seems to be closely related to Vidhur Pandit Jatak, wherein four Brahmins have renounced the world. As per this identification to the left is King Dhananjaya engrossed in listening seated cross-legged on a cushion. The expression on his face is one of involved in a serious discussion and listening attentively to his minister. All the five figures depicted correspond to the Vidhur Pandit Jatak. The Jatak narrates that the present discussion began in the beautiful park at Mangal Pokharani, hence it is very correctly painted by Bagh painters. In the third scene, we see that the scene consists of two different groups of figures seemingly overlapping each other. The subject of this fresco has also been variously interpreted. This painting includes both men and women. The upper section depicts six male figures. They all are in a posture of running or hastening towards something with their legs flexed at the knees and the lower legs stretched. The open palms extended and an eagerness displayed in the expression of the eyes and mouth. The sense of movement is also suggested by the forward thrust of their torsos. Marshall states that they are flying and issuing forth from the clouds. This description is clear particularly from one figure on the right side of the painting who seems to head the company and from the position in which he holds his legs and also from the fact the figures are shown among clouds. It is also interesting to note that even as the modeling of the figures imparts them with solidity the artist is successful in conveying a sense of weightlessness. The fact that their heads are shaven and they do not wear any ornaments seems to indicate that they are Siddha Purush. Below is the description of five female figures shown till their bust. One of the figures is shown with an instrument, probably a lute. The other four seem attendants or accompanists adorned with head ornaments and flowers in their hair. All the women are well dressed with their hair tied in a bun at back with some of them wearing necklaces and bracelets. All of them seem to wear clothes fitting bodice in various colors.
their heads are shown at various angles and they gaze in different directions. Anupa Pandey in the Buddhist cave paintings of Bagh identifies it as flight to paradise and Mount Himavant and states that this is the episode from the story of the conversion of Nand when Buddha takes Nand to heaven to show him the Apsaras that evoke an even greater passion in Nand than Sundri. Meena Talim in her work The Bath Paintings discusses three possible identifications regarding the above scene where she rejects the two primary interpretations and accepts the third one which says that painting is based on the legend of Buddha and is taken from Jatak Atkatha. Scene number four. depicts two groups of women arrayed around a man in the middle. The group on the left has seven women and the men on the right eight women, both in a semi-circular arrangement with a male figure in the center. The arrangement of the figure defines the space and the groups are well knit, with the artist establishing a connection between the figures binding them together with a fluid rhythm. The women apsaras are shown full figured with long thin noses, almond shaped eyes and full lips. Here too the bridge of nose, the lower lip and the chin are touched with white as seen in Ajanta painting. Shown from different angles, their postures convey the rhythm of music that is being played by them on various instruments from drums to cymbals and sticks. Some of the women wear an upper garment and some of them are bare. This painting shows how the painters have played with colors to impart a rhythm and harmony to the image. The scene described here is separated from the next one to the right by means of a partition which presents the appearance of green colored wall with a white coping angularly placed. There is an inscription also beneath the painting in a very faded lines in Gupta characters. The male figures in the group on the left is well dressed with locks of hair falling on the shoulders with the palms here again colored in a distinct light shade like at Ajanta turned up. His expression conveys his wonder at all that he sees and a delighted participation in it. Whereas the male figure on the second group though participating in what happens around him appears to have overcome his awe. This is the scene that was one of the earliest for which an identification was suggested as that of the Hali Salasse, a folk dance with the dancers in a ring consisting of a double group of female musicians. Anupa Pandey identifies it as the paradise scene. Nand and Celestial damsels, the episode from the story when Nand is amazed at the beauty of the Apsara in heaven and compares Sundari unfavorably with them. The scene 5 in cave number 4, depiction of scene number 5 is comparatively well preserved. and depicts a cavalcade. It consists of 17 horsemen moving towards the left in 5 to 6 rows. In the center is the cavalier over whose head appears the royal umbrella. All the figures in the painting are very well attired and the horses are very richly caprescent. Some of them having blue and white saddles and decorated with blue plumes. Conventionally drawn rocks separate the cavalcade from the elephant procession depicted ahead. In the front rides a royal personage mounted on an elephant. Mounted men, women follow behind. The work evokes curiosity about the narrative pictured in this dense composition painted with a beautiful harmony of colors that are further accentuated contrast with vivid blues and whites. Scholars are of the opinion that it is probably from the Mahavastu Avadanam where a story of horse processions of Lichavis is described. 
Anupa Pandey places this scene well in the story of Nand, identifying it as the procession of Shakya and Chief going to Buddha on his return to Kapilvastu. Another interpretation is that it represents the pleasure rites taken by Buddha before he decided to seek spiritual knowledge. Scene number 6 is separated from the cavalcade scene described above by means of a rocky wall. This painting depicts a long procession of six elephants and three horses. This is another arrival or departure scene where the whitish green grey elephant with enormous ears is shown. According to Dr. Impey, the lower elephant in advance is driven by a superior holding an open lotus flower in his hand. Behind him sits an attendant holding an umbrella over him. There are two horsemen one wearing a turban, the only one person who is covered in the whole scene. The elephant depicted are moving together through the passage with their trunks curled up. One old elephant in the middle is taller, larger and clearly visible, has a white trunk, ears and forehead, most likely the effect of scrubbing his body and his back is seen of natural color. The Mahavats have ordinary spuds and the riders on the other two elephants carry banners. The other elephants driven by men carry three women each. The two women ride astride, the third on her knees and holding on vigorously by the waist of her antecedent. The next is a very peculiar and interesting group facing exactly the contrary directions and consisting of four elephants and three horses. The personage on the elephant is of very striking appearance and of tawny complexion and long sleek locks with little blue flowers. He is naked down till waist. A short strip of blue and white dhoti is partly preserved. His elephant is covered with a housing, ochre colored and dotted. The person next to him might be his attendant shown in a close fitting coat seated behind him hold two emblems of royalty, the chauri, that is the fly whisk and the umbrella. In this crowded composition, the artists overlap figures, animals and architecture. Of primary interest in this is the figure holding the lotus flower and the three women on an elephant in front. As in the identification given by Anupa Pandey, this scene depicts elephant procession with Nand, Sundari and her companions, showing the return of Nand to Kapilvastu after his enlightenment. Thus she identifies the figure with the lotus flower in his hand and with the symbol of royalty, the umbrella over him as Nand, with the umbrella symbolizing his spiritual attainment and the three women as Sundari and her companions. Another identification of this according to some scholars is that, that this procession of elephants depicts the well-known Mahajanak Jatak. The scene 7 depicts two ascetics seated with one preaching to other as indicated by the hand gestures. This has been identified as the Anand making Nand understand the futility of, this, of his worldly desires and guiding him towards the true path. Apart from the above paintings in cave number 4, there are depictions of Buddha and Bodhisattva here, such as Buddha seated in Dharam Chakra Mudra, Buddha in Dhyana Mudra, Bodhisattva Vajrapani, among others. Similar paintings are found in cave number 3 as well. These representations of Buddha and Bodhisattvas show a fineness and delicacy with lines retaining a spontaneous feel conveying grace. The bhav conveyed is of compassion and the Forms are sensitively modeled, yet in comparison to the images of Buddha and Bodhisattva in Ajanta, they are touched with an earthly nobility. In the words of Anupa Pandey at Bagh, the paintings, despite their religious subject matter, are frankly secular, depicting contemporary life with its evident religious associations. Yet, an emotional discipline and a detached vision lift them above the transitoriness of daily life. Here the Bach artists are skillful in selecting an exact and apt incident from the Jatak. The artists of Bach caves have been very thoughtful 
in the selection of the themes. They are not only eminent and skillful, but also very ardent in propagating the essence of the topic. Unfortunately, there are only few frescoes, but all the paintings speak of their mastery and devotion to art. Now we will discuss some scroll paintings. Bag, apart from the main wall painting, has scroll paintings as well. They depict animals, bushes, flowers, fruits, foliage, and are visible on the pillars and ceilings. The lotus like a dajanta in these paintings are shown from a bud to fully blossoming flowers. These floral patterns and depictions of birds and animals in repeating patterns show fluidity of lines, delicacy of details and inventiveness. A decorative frieze that can round the walls of cave, nine has partly survived. It consists of an undulating course of stems of lotus plants with leaves interspersed with birds and animals. Bagh, though contemporaneous with Ajanta, does show some shift in approach. Stylistically, the style is more linear, with the modeling having thinned down somewhat and also exhibiting, according to scholars, a certain dilution of the spiritual aspect. Though a much smaller site it is, significant in our overall understanding of Buddhist art and more importantly the evolution of Indian painting. Now we will discuss Badami cave paintings. The exquisite caves at Badami situated in the Kaladagi collectorate in Bijapur district and 5 kilometers from Malprabha river in North Karnataka are yet another illustration of rich and unique heritage of India. The site is amazing with cliffs and imposing monoliths of pink stone towers above the magnificent blue lake. Badami caves demonstrate the excellence of the Chalukya school of art and architecture and date between 5th and 8th century AD. In the 6th century, the Chalukyas grew in the Dakkan to rule and occupy the whole of southern India for the coming 200 years. They constructed enormous art pieces. The Western Chalukyas succeeded the Vakataks in Dakkan as the most powerful dynasty. Pulikishin I founded it in 540 AD. He was succeeded by Kirtivarman and after him his younger brother Manglesh came to the throne. He was a great patron of art and architecture and created most magnificent caves and temples in his capital. Translating into Almond in Kannad, Badami is so called due to the characteristic sandstone color of its caves and the surrounding landscape. These four cave temples stand tall as a symbol of secularism and religious tolerance. The caves are dedicated to different deities, while cave number one is dedicated to Lord Shiv, cave number two and three are dedicated to Lord Vishnu and cave number four is dedicated to Jain Tirthankars. The paintings here are executed in tempera and cover an area of about 200 square feet. The main pigments are yellow, ochre, terraverte, carbon black, lime and trace blue, ultramarine. Most of the paintings have become indecipherable. The inscription of Manglesh dated 578-579 in the 12th year of his reign describes that he was a true Bhagavat and the inscription itself gives a clue that the visitor should look around on the ceilings and the walls as well as the sculpture to comprehend the wonderful decoration of the cave by the artist of Manglesh. The credit for detailed systematic study of these cave paintings goes to Stella Kramrish, who highlighted their importance and drew attention to the vaulted roof of the Mandap. Earlier scholars like Burgess and Banerjee had noticed traces of painting on the more easily visible parts of the cave but not in the places where something more tangible was preserved. The paintings at Badami are the earliest extant Brahmanical paintings. Now we will discuss the main content of these paintings. Cave number 4 shows Indra witnessing music and dance. This painting was identified on the roof of the front mandap 
where a large panel demonstrates a scene of a palace where the central figure is witnessing the music and dance There is a balcony above from where the spectators are watching the scene. There is a central figure in soft bluish green color who is seated with one foot resting on its seat and other on the padpeet. But most of this painting is obliterated and one cannot easily figure out the details. The beautiful torso of the figure and the two hands in an attractive pose can be seen effortlessly. The fingers of the right hand are skillfully portrayed the face of the image is lost but the top of the crown is preserved there is a very usual chalukyan ornament with a beautiful pendant tassel which is wrapped around the neck it's a very common sight in the sculptures which are carved on the walls as well a single earring is visible in the left ear though the other one is not noticeable now we will describe the dancers At the feet of this eminent figure a number of people are seated again not clearly visible around the majestic figure there are figures who seem to be attendants holding chambers on the left side of the scene an orchestra is seen with two graceful dancing figures The woman is shown with her back towards the viewer and the male is shown facing the audience. The former has crossed her legs and is almost in prisht swastik position with her right hand in dand and the left hand in tat kamuk. The latter is dancing in the chatur pose with the left hand in dand hast and the right hand in katak mukh raised somewhat in consonance with his eyes lifted upwards. and he was saying something commonly the male dancers has tied his hair in jat style and his ears are adorned with kundals on the other hand the female dancer is of darker shade greenish blue she has tied her hair in an elaborate style She wears earrings, armlets and bracelets. The beauty of her body is well shown in the painting. Description of musicians. There are various instrument players seated and all are female musicians. There are two flute players, drummers, mridang players evident from the instruments placed on her lap. There is another woman playing cymbals. All the musicians are well adorned with various ornaments. The fly whiskers or chavar dharins near the principal figure hold the flying wrist in a manner so as to rest some time on hand or on shoulder now we will discuss these paintings the scholar who witnessed this scene is of the opinion that the scene depicts indra in his lavish palace Vijayant enjoying dance and music the female dancers are compared to the heavenly nymphs who practice the great art of natya and the person near him is probably a teacher who is demonstrating his skill of dancing cave number 4 king kirtivarman is seated with his queens is shown the next large panel of equal size depicts king kirtivarman seated with his queens This painting exemplifies the great respect and honor that Manglesh had for his elder brother Kirti Varman. This scene depicts the royal personage seated comfortably in maharajal pose with his right leg resting on a padpeet 
his left leg raised and placed on the seat his left arm resting leisurely on his knee and his left hand held in tripatak attitude this princely figure rests on a cushion placed against the back of his seat he wears a high crown and ornaments there are several crowned princes seated to the right waiting to receive his orders towards the farthest end is a woman dressed in a lower garment and holding a staff in her hand to the left of the king is the queen attended by maids probably adorning her feet the queen is seated on a low couch with a rectangular back decorated with a border pattern all around and with cushions against it she is seated in an elegant manner her right leg touches the pad beat her left leg is placed on the seat itself she rests her right hand on her seat with her left hand in a shuchi pose the kundals drop from her earlobes other ornaments like necklaces armlets add charm and beauty to her already charming figure her hair is dressed up elegantly in a dhamila fashion and the chikur ringlets of her hair are visible from her forehead she covers her thighs with a cloth the scene is laid in the inner apartments of the palace this is evident from the perfect outline given to the architectural beauty of the palace among the chieftains below there is one of god or fair type one of swati shape and another in a dark complexion or greenish blue color similar to ones which has been already discussed the figure probably suggests a king and his hand in tripitak indicates two factors one attainment of supreme knowledge and the other of universal sovereignty on earth either of which the king has in all possibility attained he is shown with an oval halo around his head as in case of many chalukyan figures according to shiva ramamurthy the two paintings seem to be so correlated that one seems to suggest the meaning of the other they could not be better compliment paid to his beloved brother by banglesh than by presenting these two pictures side by side enhancing the power and worth of kirtivarman as a king if this portrait is not intended for Kirti Varman then it can be of his father Pulikeshan I who has so much laurels to his name the badami cave depict the flying pairs or vidyadhars one shown with his mate their hands closely entwined and neck in kathlesh the vidyadhar wears a crown kundals and a mukut yajno pavit divitya dhars hold up their hair in dhamil fashion while the female is swarthi in color her mate is fair they are happily conversing as they sail amidst clouds soaring up high in air the other is more beautiful though less preserved the vidyadhars lack kundals hanging on the ears the hair is bound up in jat fashion with lotus flower on them his concert is playing the veena in the case of this pair the masculine figure is dark greenish while the damsel is fair the cave number 4 depiction of adinath tirthankar the mural in cave number 4 is dedicated to adinath tirthankar and depicts jain saints relinquishing the word of attainment of knowledge the image depicts the jain saint sitting in center with half closed eyes in dhyan mudra and his probable devotees or attendants around him with no clothes on their body there are two people sitting on his shoulders 
the right one seems to be bare bodied whereas on the left there seems a lady sitting fully attired the tirthankar is sitting in a very attentive manner with some kind of lavish attire on his body with huge earrings and a halo beyond his head depicting the enlightenment he has gained through penance cave number 3 There is a fresco depicting Shiva and Parvati in cave number 3. The condition of the painting is such that the interpretation of the picture seems difficult. The color of the painting is wonderful and worth describing. The fragments of badami murals still evoke the images of splendor and magic of bygone eras. The tenderness and charm which emanate from these paintings are all characteristics of Chalukyan art. The sweet painted faces which have been half erased by the time poses questions for the future artist to research upon. Now we will discuss the technique of painting. The technique of painting has been studied and discussed by S. Parma Shivan in his paper Techniques of the Painting Process in Rocker Temples in Badami. The paper describes the experimental investigation wherein he studied the carrier, the ground, the pigments and the binding material used. He also studied the rough plaster and paint film and concluded that the rough plaster was relatively smoother than at other sites as it could be easily notched between fingers and reduced to powder later on his study on the binding material helped determine the nature of technique adopted he opined that the technique used was not fresco but tempera he also states that it is evident that water soluble binding material is used and that the glue has been used as a binding medium Ordinarily the colors used in the paintings are mineral colors which would retain their intensity and tone but at Badami the pigment layer is very thin and has been subject to water seepage in the past the surviving paintings are very poor in brilliance the yellow color is more prominent of all the colors and well preserved through the rest of the pigment layer is also by and large coherent The paintings have gone under elaborate chemical conservation and are preserved well. Both the plaster and paint layer are secure. In cave number 2, the paintings are in a very damaged and fragmentary condition. The badami paintings have some world famous scenes in which the figures are executed in excellent form and line. All possible precautions should be taken to preserve them for generations to come.